how big the universe is. And uh, I was reading it about it, and I was reading a book by Charles Baker on it, and he said if we, if we, if we shrink our galaxy down to a four-inch circle, okay, that big, it's 500 million miles across. And, and it's not just 500 million miles, but the next nearest galaxy, if you laid that thing on the ground, would be 67 miles from here. That's how much space there is between galaxies. So that's, a, that's almost Orlando, okay? And there are thousands and thousands of galaxies. And there are, it, from, from the outer reaches, which we don't know how far it goes, you have to travel at the speed of light in order just for a whole year, ju just to get, you know, any kind of time at all. You can't, you can't go out there in a little spaceship and go boop, 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 and shoot out there, you know, and try to run through the universe by spinning off the gravity of these other planets like uh, the Mars probe, probe did and stuff. They sent them out there and they send them around all these planets so they get the gravities. It's really cool how they did that. They, they conserved a lot of fuel, fuel, but when you're traveling at the speed of light, you're going, you're going really, really fast. I mean, in time, it's, it's just mind-boggling that, that anything can do that. So when you look at all these stars out there, many of them are gone. You're just still seeing the light from them. And so I was looking at all these numbers he had. It was fascinating stuff, and I really appreciated it. And, uh, and then I thought about the Lord when he was resurrected. And Mary tries to comfort him and touch him. And he, and he says, no, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to my father. So he's getting ready to carry the payment that he made on the cross, his blood, up into the Holy of Holies, the real Holy of Holies, the real temple, the thing that everything else down here is patterned after. He's going to take it there as, an official, as the official uh, high priest, and he's going to enter that. I mean, this is all ceremonial things, and he, and he gives it to his father. And then that afternoon, he walks through the door into a room, and they all freak out. And Thomas didn't believe that he had resurrected. Remember, Thomas Didymus? And he, he gets that, he, there was that little saying afterwards after Thomas does that, blessed are those who believe without seeing, right? So the idea that they, they did not understand what he was. They thought he was a spirit because there was no knock on the door like Peter did and you know, all that stuff. He just came right through. So the amazing thing is he goes up there and he comes back in a period of time that, that it's, it's not comparable to light speed. It's well beyond all of that. So there's something completely different in the way you can get from the third heaven to here back and forth. That's just the material world and the way it works, but that's not how we work when we go back and forth. And so, at least with him, and, and by the way, when he, did, when he went up there, he, he took people with him that were already spiritual in their bodies too, and they were, they're not gonna be resurrected till the kingdom, but they're up there now. So he took them all up there. And so when he was there talking to them, and they were doubting about his body when he says, oh, he's a spirit. And he says, no, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. Then he asks them for something to eat. Have you ever wondered why he does that? To prove that he's human. To prove, to prove, to prove that, that he has a body of flesh and bone. The best way to do it is say, give me some food, I'll show you. How many of you have ever seen uh, uh, the Casper show? the movie, uh, Casper, the yeah. first one. Yeah, right. Remember that one? Yeah. And all the, all the ghosts in the house that are having all the fun, they all come to the, the, the table to eat and they all start eating rah, 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 like that and it's all just flopping on the floor. It's the funniest thing. I laughed so hard in the theater, I thought that was pretty creative, you know? And there, there, there are all these little, you know, things going on. And I thought about that and I'm thinking, you know, he, he's getting ready to, to really train them for what's ahead. And for them, what was ahead was the tribulation and the great tribulation. 
And they were being trained, and for 40 days, they had him all to their self. And, and he taught them all those things that they're going to need to survive in that kingdom program. And that kingdom program did not come. <laughs> that kingdom program was a shutout. It was a shutdown. It was, it was the opportunity of a lifetime for Israel to have that year of extension and to, to have an opportunity to be saved and to humble themselves and actually receive the forgiveness that God had already given to them as he said he would. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And the father understood that. Uh, Christ understood it. They both knew what they were talking about. And one of those sayings from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, they didn't. You know, Paul said the same thing. He said, when he talks about what he did by persecuting the church, he says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And we have to remember sometimes when we talk to people that are unbelievers that they are ignorant of the truth of God's word, but it's not their fault. Maybe they've never seen a Bible. Maybe they can't read. Maybe they can't understand these things. And maybe it's the, it's the attitude that they've kind of learned in the world system and uh, I, I talked to somebody this week, and they were telling me about a family member, and they were just, they were just, he was just so, he's so anti-Christian that, that it, it broke up their marriage, okay? And it was a big problem, and I'm thinking, you know, some people just don't want to believe it. They just want to believe what they've already believed, and the one thing about ignorant people is that they like to stay ignorant, meaning that when they learn something, they hold on to it real tight, and they don't let go of it. So it's hard to get them off of it. And uh, ignorance is, is not just in, in, among poor people or, or, or uh, uneducated people or whatever. It's, it's across the board, okay? Mostly the highly educated are the ones that are the most ignorant of this. Because they, they tend to, to judge it by what they see on the TV. Uh, or somebody's book. Yeah, or somebody's book, or the internet, or whatever. But uh, I, was, I, was <laughs> I was flipping through the channels yesterday on something, looking for something, and I saw Peter Popov on there. And I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a, he's a TV charlatan. And, uh, but he sells miracle water in a little... Uh, container looks like ketchup comes in and it's a miracle water and you just you just got to get this and it's just 20 bucks and just you know and uh, this same guy sent something to my father-in-law one time and uh, he said hey I want you to read this and he handed it to me and it was instructions on how to to make a stand on the Bible and there was a there was a pair of socks in this thing with this letter and you read the letter and he said, go ahead and go through the whole thing. So I, I said, okay. And I looked at And it, he wants you to put the socks on. And then he wants you to put your Bible on the floor and then stand on it. And then he wants you to read this little prayer. Okay. And God's going to give you a blessing. And then, you know, you're going to get rich and all this stuff. <laughs> and I was in tears. I was laughing so hard. So when he came across the screen yesterday and I saw him, I said, oh, God, I got to stop on this one. Here we go. Let's see it, you know. And it was, it was, it was so clown, it was so clownish. Now this guy says that Paul never had anything on him. He went to the third heavens too. And he went there and saw God and came back. And this is the foundation of his ministry. So you can understand what we're up against. Okay. What do we do? Well, <laughs> we don't join them. That's the first thing we don't do. And the second thing we don't do is we don't worry about them, okay? <clears throat> Paul says, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You can't change people's minds. They have to change it themselves. They're the ones that have the choice. But if they're not presented with the right choice, then what are you going to do? You know, people around the world and, and so forth. It's a sad, sad thing. But understanding the difference between God's program with Israel and understanding that God's program with the body of Christ is essential. You have to learn that. That's one of the first things you need to learn because when you learn that, it automatically shrinks your immediate learning and reading capabilities to 
Paul's 13 epistles. From which, if you'll just read Romans 1, 2, and 3, which is where they start, by the third chapter, you're going to have to make a decision about whether you're saved or unsaved. And it's not, it's not, it's just not, you know, going to go away. You're either going to confront it or you're not. So some people just don't want to talk about it. However, in those 13 epistles, you not only have the gospel that will save you, but you have the assurance that you're going to stay saved. So when people say, well, how do you know if you're saved? Because the Bible tells me so. I learned that very early on. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But it's more than him loving you. It's what he did for you and how that continues on through your life. Even with all your foibles and imperfections, it doesn't really matter. He does not see you that way anymore. He will never charge you with a sin. He will never charge you with anything. The only thing that you're going to be dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ is your service in the body of Christ while you're here. And there are no, there are no legalities about that. It's kind of like, as I told you before, it's kind of like when you run the race, you don't run with the metal to hang on to it and keep it. You run to get the medal. So at the end, one guy gets the medal, two guys, then third guy, and there's three of them get the medal, and everybody else just doesn't get one. So they get to try next time to do better, right? But he doesn't take this thing away from them. He doesn't take anything away. But at the same time, when he talks about suffering loss, you have to say, what, what did I lose? Guy told me one time, he says, so you're saying that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it's just all about you losing a series of things while you were doing your ministry. I said, yeah, they're called opportunities. You missed them. You missed them. Have you ever missed breakfast? You're running the wrong place. I mean, if you, if you miss breakfast and it's all clean and there's nothing there, what do you do? You, you, no, you suck eggs and go to work and eat and wait till lunch. That's what you got to do. You can't just, you know, say, well, come and fix me breakfast <laughs> two hours after it's over. No, you missed it, right? And so what you don't want to miss is the joy and the happiness of him bestowing upon you gold, silver, and precious stones. He wants to do that. He wants you to take the epistles and put them in you. And as we've said many, many times, Christ died for us so he could dwell in us, so he could live through us. So it's really not you doing it, it's him doing it. And so everything that shows up in your life at the judgment seat of Christ that you had in your ministry life, this is not before you were saved, this is from the time you're saved till the time you get before him, those things are not being collected to, to, to take away from you in a sense that you're being punished. There's no, the sin issue is done. It's the service issue. Would that be like Billy Graham? Or something? Well, I mean, you know, God wants us to do the work. Why? So people get saved. If you're saved, satisfied, and sitting, nobody's getting saved in your circle of friends. Now, everybody's got two or 300 people they know. And, you know, everybody's got a Christmas card list and everybody's got a cell phone. And all that. Why can't you reach out to people and get them saved? Well, it's because it's so much more comfortable not to. Right? You start talking to people and they might say something goofy. Like, I don't believe that. Okay. <clears throat> Shake it off. <laughs> I mean, it's not that hard. You say, well, you, you have to have some sort of communication on how to handle them. You know, the opening statement is pretty important when you meet people. I went into, uh, I went to see my mom this week. Uh, I ran some supplies down there, and I took her a tangerine because she loves tangerines. These mandarin oranges are really good. I've been getting them at Publix, and man, they're like, they're like perfect. And I take them, I went down, I sit down with her, and I started peeling that thing, and she starts looking with her. <laughs> and I said, here, would you like a, a piece of this? And I cleaned it all off, and I gave it to her, and she put it in her mouth, and she goes, oh, that's so She hadn't had fresh fruit in who knows how long. She'd been eating canned fruit, you know. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. So she ate the whole thing. And then after that, she wanted to get back to her movie. <laughs> so I said, 
hey, that movie runs 24-7 in that place. <laughs> there's, there's no need to change it. <laughs> so it's really funny, but, you know, she's still got a great sense of humor, and it's funny to see her, but she's, uh, she's going to be 90 on the 20th of August. And so we're going to have a little birthday party down there at the uh, Arden Courts. And so any of you that want to come, you're invited. But it's going to be a, a hoot because uh, I, I remember uh, my, <laughs> my wife uh, was telling me she was she was thought this was kind of funny. But my cousin Chaz went in to see her, and uh, my my nephew Chaz went in to see her, and uh, he uh, <laughs> he had Leanne, his sister, with him, and. Uh, <laughs> She is Korean, right? So they walk in to see Grandma. And Grandma didn't know who they were because they've all grown up and so forth. And, uh, and so she introduced uh, the t Chaz to, to the people that were there, the nurses and everybody. And, and then she proceeded to say that <laughs> this is his Chinese wife. <laughs> And I, when I heard that, I started laughing. I said, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, she's going she's gonna to make something up on the spot and ad lib it if she has to because, you know why? Because she's had to compensate for a while on how to do that. And her big, fun, her, her big funny line was, I'm in my 80s. What do you expect? <laughs> you know? And uh, it's just the way it is. You know, it's, that's the fun of it. So, you know, she's looking forward to going to glory, but she... She doesn't understand a lot of things, and, and there are a lot of people in the world that are like that. They just don't have a clue what's going on, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And then, then what do you do? And I, I've told many people over the years, I said, you don't want to look into the casket with your wife laying there or your child laying in there or your you know, person living and, and not know where they went. You know? That's not going to hit you too hard until you start thinking about it uh, when you g get into situations like that. So when, when you, when you want to have, have an understanding of how to reach people, just try to put some things together in your mind, and that's what we're going through now to help you do this, okay? The gospel, you have a gospel that you can believe, okay? This gospel is easy to believe. Just believe that Christ died for your sins, and you get, etern you get eternal life right there on the spot, okay? You can believe it. It's easy. You've got a Bible that you can trust. This book is, is trustworthy, and that's because it's God's Word. Now, one of the things that we looked at before in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 was that it effectually worketh also in you that believe it. So if it works in you, what is that? Well, that's Christ living his life out through you. But what else is it? It's the security that you have in Christ being sure of heaven, okay? Uh, Mr. O'Hare used to say, are you a hope-so church member or a no-so Bible Christian? Do you understand what it means to be saved, and can you give a testimony to it? Well, when you start thinking about it, so how, does that, how does that grow in you? Well, it grows in you by the assurance. The, the, uh, the assurance just gets greater and greater and greater. The thing that's growing in you is your assurance that you're not going to heaven. You're already in it right now. As far as God's concerned, you're there, okay? Turn to Romans. Hold your place in Isaiah. Go to Romans with me just for a second. I just want to share this verse with you because God doesn't think like we think because he's not a man. I'm talking about the Godhead and God the Father, but he, uh, he is now a man, and the entire Godhead is going to live through eternity now in the person of Jesus Christ. So when he tells Abraham he's going to have a son, and he's going to have a family, and he's going to be a father of many nations, and uh, I always thought for a while, going, what? How, what does that mean, many nations? He's only the father of one nation, I thought, the nation of Israel. No, he's the father of many nations. He's the father of many nations. He's the father of Gentile nations. How did he do that? How did he become the father of other nations? He married into these women, and he had children by them. You remember the big smart idea of the week was that Sarah, who could not have a baby because she's barren, 
And God says, no, you're going to have a baby. And she laughed, and that's why they called his name Isaac. She says, you take Hagar the Egyptian into the tent, and you get us a baby. And that's what he did. And you know what happened from that? The Ishmaelites came from that. And if you'll read after she dies, how many more people, a young women or whatever he married? He produced a lot of people, many nations. And I'm not saying they're, they have anything with being good, but it's almost like he becomes the father of this nation and then he messes it up by creating a whole bunch of enemies to fight him. <laughs> it's really silly, you know? But at the same time, he couldn't understand why God was saying these things to him when he only had one steward named Eleazar and he was going to leave everything he had to him. That was it. He says, I don't have any children. I'm not going to have kids. Look at me, how old I am. Well, guess what? Here's what he says. Romans, two, or Romans 4, verse 16. And 17. Notice this. He says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only, not to that only which is of the law, Israel, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now he says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things, verse 17, which be not as though they were. He talks about something in the future because he doesn't go forward and, and try to read the future. He creates it as he goes forward. So as he begins, think about thinking something, and it actually happens as you think it. It actually comes into, do you know how he made the world? He spoke it into existence. Now, that's mind boggling, okay? So when he looks forward in time, he's not looking ahead like a, a necromancer would do and try to read the crystal ball into the future. He's, he is the future. He doesn't live in time. He lives outside of it. He created it for us. We have rhythms and we have cycles and we have things. We, we can't live that way because we're not omniscient. We don't know everything. We're not omnipresent. We can't be over there and over here at the same time. We're not all powerful. We're not omnipotent. So those things are all attributes of the Godhead. And so God can look into the future and Satan cannot. Satan can't even read your mind. So he's got a real disadvantage, doesn't he? So when he talks about these things that which be as though they were, that, that was puzzling to Abraham. And so we understand that, that the way that you can trust your Bible is to start with Paul's epistles and learn the whole thing first quick. This is the cheat sheet for the KJV. 13 epistles explain the whole rest of the book. The first thing they explain is the first 39 books are not to you and the last, what is it, 12 books or whatever it is, are not to you either. Hebrews or Revelation. So when you have... When you have a knowledge and everybody knows, hey, there's a fence, stay away. Don't go over the fence. Okay, I'm going to stay right here in my, little, in my little place where I can, you know. They say kids, when you put them out in the yard without a fence, you know, you shouldn't fence them in, you know. Well, if you put them out there without a fence, they all stay in a group. You put a fence up, they're just all over the place because they got a boundary and they know where they can go, right? Same way with us. We have... These epistles, the primary reason is to train us and bring us to an understanding of how to get people saved. And then once they get saved and they're a new baby and it's not even been 12 hours yet, then you've got to start working with them to try to get them to understand now what is your purpose in life. Because their purpose in life has just been completely destroyed by the fact they got saved. They, they don't know what to do now. And so... 
when you do that, you have to reassure them. And studying the Bible and studying Paul's epistles, which, by the way, is just, it's, it's less than 25,000 words. I mean, you just take these, these few pieces of paper here and you read them, but you're reading, you're reading words that are so much more powerful than anything else you're going to read in the other parts of the Bible. Now, why is that? It's not because the rest of the Bible isn't powerful. It's because it's not written to you. Love letters are great. But if I get one, I want it to be from my wife, not from the neighbor lady. It doesn't mean anything to me. If I get my power bill and I pay it and put it back in the thing and I send it out, if it's somebody else's that the, the mailman got mixed up with, I just paid his power bill and mine's still, oh, it's off. <laughs> because you don't know if you don't look at so if you get the bill like that look at the person's name on it first and divide it from all the other envelopes you got okay so you can understand and when you get that understanding you know what the assurance does for you the security of it oh my gosh the peace is is, is so much better uh, I was, uh, we did a funeral Saturday for Jan uh, Hampshire, and, uh, you know, it was great. They had a great turnout, didn't they? They had a nice big room, and they had about 60, 70, 80 people in there, and it was great. Family all came and everything. But, you know, something scares me when I do a funeral. And, uh, and sometimes I get the same feeling when I'm preaching to a group of people that, are, that I don't know, a large crowd, like at a conference or whatever. And, and you get the same feeling. And you know what the feeling is? And you know, how you, you know how I get it? It's by the looks on the people's faces. Right? Some of them are smiling and they're happy. And some of them are like deer in the headlights. They're just going. Like you're tearing it all away from them. You're like peeling them like a banana because they're hearing things for the first time that they don't understand. And... It's, it's shaking their foundation because their foundation isn't really a good foundation. It's somebody else's. I went to the doctor to get my glasses changed, and I got done, and uh, I was driving down the road, and I'm going, what in the world is happening? I couldn't understand what was going on. I couldn't see out of the glasses. I'm going down the road. I'm going, what? <laughs> and and I, I, I stopped. I pulled over, and I looked at these glasses. I goes, those aren't my glasses. So you know what happened? My doctor gave me his glasses, and he kept mine. And I, I never saw him again. He couldn't see me. I couldn't see him, so why am I going to go back? I, I said, hey, I'm, I'm. So I go to his son now, you know about two blocks away from me and he knows what he's doing but you know how it is when when people get a little bit forgetful and they do something wrong things come apart you know and so you find yourself with the wrong set of glasses on I wasn't going to drive all the way home I said no I turned right around I was only about three blocks away and I turned right around and took them back I went in and I said hey you're, go get my glasses the doc gave me his glasses and she looked at me and she goes he does that I said, <laughs> I'm glad he's not a brain surgeon, you know. That's the way it goes. If you read somebody else's mail, it's not going to work in your life, right? One of the key issues is you know you're saved. And when somebody says, hey, how do you know that? They say, well, his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm his. How does it do that? He, it, he does it when you read his words. If you get a, a letter, like I mentioned a while ago, if you get a nice love letter, are you going to read it once and put it back? I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to read it over and over and over. Okay? To me, that, that's the idea. My wife, she writes beautifully, and she gives me these great cards. And I get these cards. and I, We don't write letters because we're with each other most of the time. But I get these cards from her. And I'm thinking, why couldn't I write something like that? I try. I'm so woefully inept in it. I'd rather just show her, but you know. But when you write something down like that, and, and I know she means it, you know what you do? You save it. 
I got maybe six or seven shoeboxes full of these cards. And you know what I do with them? I think I would probably grab those before I grabbed anything else. Because to me, that's the communication of assurance to me that I am still as she wants me to be. And that's a hard thing to comprehend because I know me. And I know her. <clears throat> and, and so I understand the difference when you marry up. And I was very fortunate. But I have assurance. I don't have to worry about it. Proverbs 31 says that uh, the Proverbs 31 man there says that her husband can safely trust in her. Trust. And so when you trust the Lord and you, and you live life with that thinking, you have to kind of have that love relationship with him and then you want to be able to go out and tell people and say, I'm just going to take a chance at it. When I was at the, to see my mom, I walked up to some people and I, I was talking to them, uh, some of the nurses, and uh, I started a conversation with them about it right then and there. There was like five of them standing there. And uh, I got done with that conversation. I went in and sat down with my mom feeding her the tangerine. This kid comes in. He works there. He sits down, and he begins to chat with me. And before you know it, I'm handing him a card, and he's supposed to come to church. Okay? So, I mean, I, I got a lot of work done in just about 45 minutes there just by opening my mouth. So I ask myself, if you open your mouth about everything else in your life, you should be opening it about, about this more than anything else. Because it is a message that you can believe. It is from a book that you can trust. And it is a study that you can really understand. Okay? And the only thing you have to do to do that, to understand fully what's going on, is just read it. And if you hit a word that you don't understand, do exactly what I tell my kids. They've been telling me this for years, and I tell it right back to them. Google it, okay? If you don't know it, Google it, all right? And check it, because there might be something in there in that word that you just don't get. And you don't want to be caught as being ignorant, so you just move on past it. Don't do that. Find out what these words mean. Because the words in a King James Bible aren't changing. The, the modern Bibles, they're changing every year, every time they do a new version and perversion. And before you know it, you, you could have, in a, in a congregation of 100 people, you could have 40 people using an NIV, and they're all different editions, and they're all saying the same thing. How can you put a guy in a pulpit with a Bible and everybody else have something completely different? Is that confusion or what? So if you're gonna if you're gonna get serious about this, and I encourage you to do so because it's not because you have to do it, you don't have to do it. What you need to do is learn how much joy and fun it is to tell somebody about the Word of God and to tell somebody about your Savior and to talk to them about things. And when they say Bible study, some people say it scares them. But at the same time, other people, like I talked to a lady this week, she called me, and we had a nice chat, and uh, she's got some family members that are they're, they're going through this process I told you about, and uh, they're, they're wanting to send them. I said, look, I, she wanted to know whether we're a Grace Church or not. I said, yes, ma'am, we're a Grace Church. And I've been a Grace preacher for going on 40 years now. You know? I preached my first message when I was about 21, 22. And that was, I was before I was even married. And uh, I liked it. I thought it was great. I didn't do very well, but I, I, you know, I did what I did. I, I preached off a, a, a sheet. And uh, my, uh, my father-in-law had had uh, hemorrhoid surgery that day. And he came with his little donut that you blow up, sit on the seat. And uh, he sat it next to him, and he sat down in the chair because it was padded. And by the time I got done, he was sitting on that donut because he was tired of that. I, I, I'm and the preacher. The preacher in the place I was preaching, it was in a house. He's in the back going, 
<laughs> I said, okay, I'm done, and I had to quit. I preached an hour and 15 minutes or so, and uh, I thought I was supposed to do the whole sheet. I didn't realize it. Otis had gone to Savannah, and uh, he left me this sheet to preach. I said, okay, so I preached the whole thing. And he, no, I just preached it. He started laughing when he heard it because he said, oh, you just, just preach three or four of those. And he didn't say that. <laughs> he just said, here it is. He thought I'd understand that. Well, sure, he could preach the first one for three weeks, and it wouldn't have mattered because he knew it all. But the thing was, I had to sit and read that thing and study it and go through it for about two weeks before I did this. And I didn't realize that I was kind of messing with uh, my future father-in-law. And uh, so he messed with me, I messed with him, we, got, we went back and forth, and, uh, and then he got me really good one time. So, you know, you, you, you never know what's going to happen. If you love the Lord and you want to know that you're saved all the time with great assurance, then... Just keep reading Paul's epistles at three chapters a day, and, and then anything else you want to read, go at it, okay? So we're going to talk about this verse here. I go to Isaiah chapter 2. We're going to make two comparisons here, and uh, Isaiah chapter 2. If you've got a, uh, a Schofield reference Bible... with no red letters and wide margins, then you're going to be on page 714. See how easy that is? <laughs> okay, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. Now, here's what we're going to say. This is about the issue of prophecy mainly concerns the nation. So the concept of prophecy and what it is. Prophecy is foretelling something in the future that's going to happen. Prophecy is also preaching something like we're doing right now that's going to happen. So he might prophesy, the prophet might write it down in a book, which they usually do, and it's, it's out of that message that God gives them, they just keep repeating it as, as often as they can. And they just keep preaching, and they got stoned for it. They got killed for it. They got sawed asunder for it. They got burnt. They got all, I mean, when you, get, when you take on this job, you're messing with some people that don't want you to be talking. <laughs> and it becomes a problem. But here's how it goes. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, the nations are who Israel will go to. They're going to take the message of the kingdom of heaven when it comes down from heaven, and it's here, and it's all parked and ready to go. They're going to reach out to those nations. Most of the nations are going to be messed with, <laughs> and that, of course, we're all the way past this now. We're out of here. And it's going to happen right there. All of this in the future is going to happen in seven years that are 360 days each. Okay? Their years in Israel are 360 days. And two-thirds of the nation of Israel, who does not want God to even exist, they die during this time. Two-thirds. they got 16 to 20 million of them now. You do the math. Okay? So... When that is done, when that destruction comes, it doesn't come until the Great Tribulation. So the, the period here is divided into two three-and-a-half-week periods, three-and-a-half weeks of years. In other words, three-and-a-half years, three-and-a-half years. And the second half is total desolation. There's, there's nothing going on but, but wrath and punishment and all this stuff just come. Everything that God could put on the world, he puts it on right there. And he does it all by speaking it. And so what happens is, it's just kind of like a burnt match head when it's done. And 
Then out from underneath the hiding places come the Jews that have hidden themselves like they were told to do. They were smart. They obeyed it. And they ran. And they got, they, and God hit them. And for three and a half years, he fed them manna. All the things that he did back here in Egypt, he does over here. That's all forecasting. And I told you before, there's going to be some hideous creatures come out of the bottomless pit and going to mess with people in the world. The giants are going to come back. And I'm not talking, as I said before, about the short ones. I'm talking about the tall ones. I'm not talking about Goliath at nine foot six. We're talking about giants that are so tall that their, their walled cities reach unto heaven. These are giant, giant people. And if you want to get an idea of probably how big they are, and nobody really knows this at this point, but from the skull, by the way, Ohio has a huge amount of these bones for some reason. But in some of these places, they're, they're finding bones that are human bones that are, let's just say if they, if they were to see a T-Rex, they would not be afraid of it, okay? <laughs> That's how big these things were. Now, now the, the, the biggest one we know of is 13 and a half feet, okay? Which is probably about where that speaker is right there. Maybe a little bit taller. Maybe that light over there. 13 and a half feet. He had to make a bed out of iron to lay on it. There's 36 different tribes of giants and 22 individually named giants in the Bible. And I've been studying this and I'm thinking, wow, man, what, what, what is the purpose? Well, we know what the purpose is now, don't we? They're going to come back over here. And they're going to scare the weeby jeebies out of a lot of six-foot people, okay? Because they're going to come back, and God is going to bring everything you've ever seen back here. He's going to show, it's all going to show up right here. And it is going to be a mess. It is incomprehensible. When you think about all that God has done and created and everything he's, he, that he is, you, you would not want to be on that end of the stick, would you? And people want to die over here. I mentioned it last week. They, want to, they pray for the rocks to fall on them. They won't pray to God, but they'll pray for rocks to fall on them. That's religion, by the way. But he says that they won't die because death shall escape them. So he's going to say, no, you're not dying today. You're going to stay and take it. You're going to take all of it, okay? And, oh, my gosh, you know, you think about that, you go, oh, they can't even die. People would just, you know, today there's people doing a situation like that. You know, if a guy's wounded or something, they leave him behind, they're being overrun in the army, they leave him a gun at least, you know, and shoot himself. He doesn't have to be tortured. Oh, no, God's going to torture him. He's going to torture him like you cannot believe. He's going to torture him until he's satisfied with it, okay? I would not want to be on that list because he knows everybody. He knows them all, <laughs> But this, this nations, this thing with the nations, it culminates right here at the second coming, and it's, it's all over. And the only nations that are going to get to go into that kingdom are the ones who stood with Israel. And people say today, well, we, we stand with Israel. We do. We stand with the nation of Israel right now, the, the nation that's there. But that's not the true nation of Israel. That's the secular nation. Yeah, that's not the spiritual nation. So the nation that's going to live in this kingdom is going to sit on the throne with God, and they're going to rule and reign over all the nations for a thousand years. And then God's going to move it all to the new heaven and the new earth. And he's going to create that. You see it in Revelation 22. Just go back and read it, and you can see the angels are out there measuring the thing, showing you how big it's going to be. And it's going to be phenomenal. The concept of the nations and prophecy, it's all future. It's running through time, okay? But it, it's the last seven years of it is right there, and it happens right after we're gone. And this insertion here in the dispensation of grace has already gone on for 2,000 years. And it wasn't even prophesied. It was kept secret. So God just took the program and he just stuck us right there in the middle. Because his nation over here, when they stoned Stephen, they fell. And he says, okay, 
you, you, you've, you've already lost your status as a, a political empire under Solomon was the one that lost that. And then now after this took place, they got that year to try to go ahead and just please believe what happened. And they wouldn't believe it. And so instead of, instead of just leaving it all alone, what did they do? They stoned Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit, because and they were all full of the Holy Spirit that, that first year. And when they blasphemed him, they spoke against him and stoned him. You can't, you can't speak against somebody any worse than stoning them. So they stone him, and what happens is they commit that sin unto death. And that will be done over here, too. See, over here, it was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, over here, it will continue that way, and he's going to, uh, anybody who worships the beast and gets into that false religious system, they're done. They can't, once you make that move and take that mark, I don't know if you saw it this week, but they showed this guy uh, getting a, a chip put in his hand. And he was wincing real bad because it hurt him when they put it in there. But they put that chip in there so he doesn't have to carry a credit card. He's just, oh, that guy's going to lose a hand, okay? I'm going to chop that thing off and go up and, you know. That, you don't do that kind of stuff. It's stupid, okay? But, but they don't know it. So in this period right here, if you take the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. You can't get on a plane. You can't go get groceries. You can't get gas. You can't do anything. And it's going to be terrible. So the nations are going to come to their final end, the Gentile nations, and they're going to be crushed. And the ones that decided to follow Israel, they're going to get to go into the kingdom and have an opportunity to get saved. They don't get saved instantly just because they did that. They just have the opportunity to go in because they had sympathy for him and for Israel. Okay? That group over there today... They're just Zionists that decided to go take the Holy Land back from the Arabs. Well, the Arabs don't have any title to it either. All of the Arabs, all the Arab world, they have no entitlements in the Holy Land. They can, they can move around in it, right? They can move around in it, but they, but they can't ever own it because it already belongs to Israel, okay? And it's always been a battle to get Israel, uh, for Israel to get them out. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a real history thing. Okay, so now if you take the, we're going to end with this one. The, the, the prophecy issue is one thing. It mainly concerns the nations. And it has to do with Israel and the separation of Israel. She's not to be reckoned among the nations. She's separate and apart. She's God's, she's God's holy nation. She is really her, uh, she is, if you read the book of Hosea, that's uh, Hosea's wife uh, went, went out against him and, and committed adultery and stuff. And so what happened was he kept trying to get her back. And it's a picture of how God's going to get Israel back. And how does he do it? He turns the whore into a virgin again. How does he do that? Well, God can do it. And he brings about this new group of people. And, and all the people that have ever been saved... Here, as a result of the nation of Israel, all the people that got saved before Israel was a nation, that 2,500 years from Adam to Moses, all, that, all these Gentiles that have gotten saved, minus us, that's who, that's who benefits in that kingdom. Okay? The Gentiles today and the Jews today have been concluded there's no difference. Okay? So there's, there is no Gentile Jew issue today. That wall that separated those two is down. And it's temporarily off limits. We don't have to worry about that. Now, turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. We'll stop with this one. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. And look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, sorry. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. No, yeah, there it is. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, what's the conclusion? 
then everybody was dead. They were all dead. He says, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, in the four Gospels, he says, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We don't know him that way anymore. We've moved on from that. He's exalted in the heavenly places. He's the head of the church, the body of Christ. The mystery's now been revealed. And so now the mystery issue is about individuals. It's not about nations now, right? So it's about individuals. He says, therefore, if any man, look at verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's no reason to try to go out there and get born again. You don't have to be born again. If you're, if you're going to be born again, you had to be born the first time, right? Wouldn't that be logical? You're born the first time, then you get reborn, okay? Well, he's not talking about individuals in John 3.16. He's talking about when Israel became a nation and she came out of Egypt, what happened? That's when she became a nation, right? So she was born as a nation over there, and over here when Jesus is talking in John 3.16... To Nicodemus, uh, that had to come by night because he was skulking around. He didn't want anybody to know what he was doing. And he said, I don't understand how you can go back into there and come. He was thinking fleshly. And he says, no, we're talking about the spiritual life of Israel. They have to be reborn spiritually. They've been born here physically, and now they're a nation. And so, and, and Christ was from that nation, so was Nicodemus. But now it's about the individual. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And look at verse 12. He says in verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The Greek there is just an educated Gentile. Okay? He says, For the same Lord is over all, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Okay? So when you see it that it's individuals, you can see that it's any man can get it. Look at 1 Corinthians now. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now you can see every man. Any man. Every man. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And look at verse 13. He says in verse 12, he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We mentioned a while ago, when you when you're, get your new body on the day of redemption, we're all going to get it at the same time. And we're all going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And every single member of the church, the body of Christ, from the Apostle Paul, who was the first one put in there, to right where we are over here. Every single person that ever trusted that Christ died for their sins, admit it, they're there. You're there, I'm there, we're all there. This is the biggest picnic we've ever been to. And it's going to be much greater than a picnic. Let me say this. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, and then he has another category of wood, hay, and stubble, what's the difference between those two? The, the, the precious part, the gold, silver, and precious stones is what he did through you when you let him do it. Yeah. The wood, hay, and stubble is what you wanted to do, <laughs> which means it might have meant I'm just not going to do anything, okay? And so, okay, or whatever you do, it might be wrong, okay? In other words, you might be preaching a false gospel to people and sending people to hell. Well, you wouldn't want to be doing that if you were a Christian, but, but people do it every day. They do it every day. He says, every man's work. Now, notice verse 13. Not just any man can have it, but he says, all of those who get saved today in the dispensation of grace, he says, every man from that group, every woman, every man, every man's work of what sort it is. And so there's going to be a review. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, you see probably the best section to really learn about the fact that this is about 
individuals and how they're separated from Jew and Gentile. Uh, if, you, if you notice, this wall is up here. That means that there's the, the Jews have, this pictures the Jewish nation as being in God's favor, okay? When they're up here, they're in good with the Lord. When they're down here, well, they've got to be Gentiles, but then they fall down here, and now, today, there's no difference. And that's what Paul's going to explain in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. He says in verse 11, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, it's natural for the circumcision to call you uncircumcision, okay? Because you're not what they are. That at that time ye were without Christ. Now get this. This is where they were. This is where us Gentiles were before the body of Christ was released to Paul and given to Paul. Here's where we were. He says that at that time, in time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no part in it. God gave them up, having no hope, he says, and without God in the world. That's pretty desperate, isn't it? That's terrible. And he says, verse 13, he says, but now. But now what? You see, but now there, if you go down to verse 4 of chapter 2, you see, but God. But God, but now. But when you see that but, you see that idea of it was this way and now it's changed. So, oh good, that's what we want. We want to change. We don't like that other situation. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes were far off, who, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh, are, were made near to him by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath broken, made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in, him, uh, in himself of twain two one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You see, God made a difference back here between Jew and Gentile, Jews up here, Gentiles down here. Why did he make that difference? To prove that there is no difference. And, and over here, they proved it real good. And so then now we're in this one big pot of soup now. And the only way you can get in is just believe that Christ died for your sins. And God's got a special plan for us. And that special plan requires you to learn Romans 3, 5, Lehman. You're going to go up into the heavenly places. And you're going to be treated like kings and queens because you are going to be princes and princesses. Okay? Queens, kings, you're going to be rulers. That's what you're going to do out there. Somebody's got to do it because when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to have to empty out the heavenly places because there's resistance there. He, him and Gabriel, the archangel, or uh, Michael, the archangel, and Gabriel, they're all going to come and they're going to destroy all of that stuff out there and we're going to be put in their place. And then they're going to be free to come on down here and set up the kingdom. And Satan, that happens in the middle, right before the tribulation begins, right there. And, boy, he doesn't like that because he knows his time is short and he's, he's starting to realize that I think I messed up. <laughs> so we'll probably be in the heavenly places when the adversaries are still there. Well, we're going to be brought up through the heavenly places with a military escort. That's why Michael comes for us to take us up through there. There's no danger of us going up there and being messed with. What it is, it's a, you ever heard of a triumph before? Mm -hmm. the, the idea of a triumph is where they bring all the, the spoils along with the people, you know, and they got the animals and they've got the cages with all the exotic animals and they got all the booty all the money man we got all the girls we got all the guys they're all in chains right and they do these big processionals from from when they go to the war and they bring them back that's the booty that that's the whole idea and so we're going to be taken up through the heavenly places when they're still there and when we're taken up they're going to see their own replacements yeah. have you ever heard of anybody 
being replaced and they got to see their replacement if you're in a if you're in a company and you're going to get replaced and you actually get to see the person that's going to take your place because they want you to train the people that you've just gotten in new so that so that that guy would understand you know oh, oh that's not cool i don't want to do that well they don't want to see that because that means they lost the heavenly places the second heaven the stellar universe i was talking about long ago it's not theirs anymore it never was so when we get it we are now going to watch this whole thing happen and this whole thing as a matter of fact, we're, we're going to run it while God is down here doing his business. You see, the body of Christ is more than just a group of Gentiles getting saved. It's an actual gift as part of Jesus Christ's inheritance from his father to him. Isn't that weird? Here it is. I got a present for you. All these Gentiles that, that got saved, and they got saved in spite of Israel, even though Israel didn't want to believe their own Messiah, and they fell. He said, fine, we'll just bypass them, and he just gives it straight to Paul. Right. You can't believe how fortunate you are. Don't complain. Right? The three C's, criticize, condemn, and complain, knock it off. Because... Because what you have here is not only the opportunity to get saved and get edified and get built up. You have an opportunity to, to choose your own placement up there if you really want to work at it. And on top of it, you're going to go up there into the heavenly places and you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And the angels are now going to be at your disposal. Now, they're, they're innumerable. You can't count them. So when he says, ye shall judge the angels, don't you know that we shall judge the angels? He's talking about having authority over them, and they're going to, to do exactly what you tell them to do. Because you'll have the mind of Christ, and you won't be able to make a mistake or a bad decision. Isn't that great? You would think they would be packing the parking lot out there to get in this place. You know what? This is exactly how it worked in the Old Testament. It's exactly how it worked with Paul in his day. And it's going to keep on working this way. Right? Yeah. This is mighty work to do. It's, it's mighty to do this kind of work. But people don't get it because they haven't read the story. Okay, we're done. Um, we'll have